morning, students. Um, at least morning for me. Uh, so we're going to talk today about designing experiments and ethics as the topic of the section. So this is, um, first off, I want to talk a little bit about how you design a statistical experiment, some of the things you need to watch out for. So last class we talked about choosing a sample and how do you decide which people to study. These are more of the questions of once you've got those people picked out, how do you design the study to find an answer to the question that you're interested in, okay? And so we're going to talk a lot about terminology. There's actually not a lot of mathematics um, in this section. That we'll do some graphs at the end. We'll talk about how um, uh, creating graphs can be part of the ethical part of this. But um, mostly this is going to be terminology um, that you'll need to kind of understand uh, for future um, more mathematical material. Okay? So the first thing we're going to talk about today in experimental design is the idea of a variable. So if you think about conducting an experiment, trying to study something, um, you're always going to be trying to, the idea of a scientific experiment, whether that's a um, physical science or a social science or whatever you're studying, is always to try and explain one thing in terms of another. Okay, so you might ask something like, um, and this is the question we're going to kind of focus on today, does caffeine intake improve test scores? Okay, so this is actually an interesting question because uh, people have studied this. So if you take a bunch of caffeine, um, like if you chug an energy drink or take, drink a bunch of coffee right before an exam, um, or when you're studying for an exam or at various times, does that improve how well you do on the exam? Okay? And so I will tell you from what I've seen, the results are mixed. Some people have found that yes, it does. Some people have found no, it doesn't. Some people have found that it's inconclusive. So there's not really good answers on this. Um, but what I want to talk about less so than the actual science of it, which you might be interested in, so if you want to, you can read about it, um, is more like how we study this, okay? So what we're looking at here, we're asking the question, does caffeine intake improve test scores? And the way that we study this in a scientific way is we try and see like if somebody who takes more caffeine or some caffeine as opposed to no caffeine, some amount, whatever, um, has a higher test score or a lower test score, how does it change, okay? And so we call these two things, the amount of caffeine that they took, their test score, both of those are quantitative pieces of data, uh, quantitative continuous, if you remember from the last class, because there's lots of different possible values. Uh, this is a measurement, this is a percentage. So we take one piece of quantitative continuous data and we wanna know if it causes a change in another piece of quantitative continuous data. So these are both called variables, um, and we split them into two different names. So caffeine intake here is what's called the explanatory variable. Okay, And so the idea, and again, we talked a little bit last time about how this is always a little bit tricky to see, but uh, the idea is that the explanatory variable is one that we're going to change and see if it causes a change in the other one, okay? So the explanatory variable is the one that we kind of control when we're starting the experiment. The other variable, what's called the response variable, is the one that we want to measure whether it changes when we change the first one. So if we change caffeine intake, does the response variable, which is test scores, change in response? Okay, and so loosely speaking, the idea here is that the explanatory variable is the cause and the response variable is the effect. Now that's not necessarily true. Um, you may see a change in one and a change in the other and there's no actual cause and effect relationship. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But that's the idea. So the explanatory variable is what we theorize is the cause the response variable is what we theorize is the effect, even if it doesn't turn out to be the case in practice, okay? 
So these are the two variables um, that we're going to work with. Um, every study will have an explanatory variable and a response variable. So the explanatory variable being what we think is the cause, the response variable being what's called the effect. Um, but there may actually be other things that are affecting our results, okay? And these are what are called lurking variables. So these are other aspects of the situation. could be causing our result. Okay? So, for example, let me, going off of this question, say we did a study of does caffeine intake improve test scores, and we surveyed 100 college students, and we asked them how much coffee do you drink, and what was your score on this exam, right? Um, and maybe we find that the more caffeine somebody drinks, the worse they do on an exam. Okay? And that might be counterintuitive to you, those of you who, who drink a lot of coffee and feel like it makes you better at exams. But say in that group of 100 students, maybe of the students who drank the most coffee, say the stu 50 students who drank the most coffee, maybe those are students who are working two jobs, um, not getting a lot of sleep, staying out partying, right? And they drink a lot of coffee because they're not getting a lot of sleep. Do you think that those are the students that you would expect to do really well on exams? Um, you know, they don't have a lot of time to study. Um, if they're staying out partying, maybe they're not spending a lot of effort on their study. So the fact that they're drinking more caffeine and that they're scoring poorly, it may not be the more caffeine that's causing them to score poorly. It may be the lack of sleep or the lack of amount of time to study that's causing them to do poorly on the exam. Those are the lurking variables. And this is what I said about the cause and effect piece of explanatory and response. When we set up the experiment, we theorized that caffeine intake would cause a change in test scores. But it turns out it wasn't causing the change in test scores, or maybe it was only causing some of it. These lurking variables of not getting enough sleep were causing more of the problem. Okay? So there are ways to deal with this. Um, so there are tools that we can use to kind of prevent lurking variables from um, causing us problems. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about those. Um, so first off, I want to give you one more term before we go into those techniques. So what's called a treatment. So a treatment is a basically a quantity of the explanatory variable that's kind of the most vague and not really informative kind of um, definition of this but basically if you think of like the um, caffeine intake study um, you might say one treatment is students who took who drank one cup of coffee before the exam another is students who drank two cups of coffee or the equivalent three cups of coffee, four cups of coffee. Those would be the different treatments um, Our students who drank no cups of coffee. So a treatment is kind of a different amount of whatever you're um, starting the study with. Okay, so it comes from medical terminology where you might give one uh, group of patients a particular pill and another group of patients a different pill. Okay, so a treatment in the sense of a medical treatment. Um, but in the broader sense of statistical studies, a treatment can be kind of any different amount of the explanatory variable. Okay? Um, another related term is what's called uh, a placebo. So uh, a placebo is a treatment, those of you who have done some nursing and some medical science um, and know kind of what this means. So a treatment that doesn't do anything. So in medical experiments, a lot of times this is a sugar pill. It's just a fake pill that they give people so that they think that they're getting some sort of medicine, but they don't actually get anything. Um, 
So the group that receives the placebo that doesn't receive any kind of treatment is called the control group. And so this is what I was saying about kind of ways of designing studies so that they work better. Um, if you were going to design the study of caffeine intake and test scores in college students, you would want to have a group of students who don't take in any caffeine, who for whatever reason don't drink co coffee, don't drink tea, don't drink energy drinks. That would be your control group, okay? Because what you might see is that the group that doesn't take in any caffeine does really poorly on exams as compared to the other group that does better, right? So you want to have something to compare to. You can't say that caffeine is causing the increase in test scores if you don't have a group that's kind of a baseline to compare to. And that's what the control group is, okay? Now, if we want to take this even further um, and we want to get rid of some of those lurking uh, variable issues, generally what we'll do is we will randomly assign different people to different treatment groups. So if we wanted to really study whether caffeine intake um, affected student test scores, we would say, okay, you're signing up for this study, don't drink any coffee, don't drink any energy drinks or anything like that. We're going to give you something specific. And so maybe half of the students come in and they don't get anything. They're our control group that we were just talking about. The other half come in and we give them one energy drink and say, here, drink this energy drink before you take the exam, okay? So now we would have a control group and we'd have a group that's receiving a treatment that actually has caffeine in it, okay? So if we randomize those two groups, right, so we randomly select whether you don't get an energy drink or randomly select whether you do get an energy drink, it can take care of kind of evening out those other problems. So if we randomly assign them, some of those students who are not sleeping well, who are working lots of jobs, who are staying out partying, will be in one group, and some of them will be in the other group. And hopefully they'll both kind of average out so that they don't affect our overall results, okay? So that's one way of making our study better. An even better one um, is what's called blinding a study. So something very interesting about human beings especially um, is that people will actually do better um, or do worse, depending on exactly how they approach it, if they know that they're being studied, okay? So if you brought all these students in and said, we're doing a study, we believe that drinking an energy drink before an exam makes you do better. And so this group over here, those poor kids are not getting an energy drink. They're gonna take the exam, probably not gonna do that well you are getting this energy drink, we're expecting you to do amazing, right? If you set this up, those students who were told that they're getting the energy drink, that it's gonna help them do better, will actually do better. Uh, that's how powerful the, the human brain is, and the psychologists study this effect. Um, this is actually, it's called the placebo effect, because even if you don't give them, even if the energy drink doesn't have any caffeine in it, um, even if it's a placebo, they'll still do better, okay? So in order to get around this, um, we do what's called a blind study, okay? And so what a blind study is, is it means subjects don't know what treatment they're getting. Okay? So in this example, we would bring all 100 people in, whether they're in the control group or the group that's getting caffeine, and we would give everybody a nondescript mug and say, here, drink this. It's either, um, it either is an energy drink that has caffeine in it or it's not. We're not gonna tell you which one it is. Um, they would drink. Mine does have caffeine in it. This is tea. Um, keep me going on these mornings. Um, and then they wouldn't know whether they're actually getting the caffeine or not, okay? And so that way, that effect, that placebo effect, won't influence how they do. 
because they don't know if they got the caffeine or not. Okay? Even more interesting, it turns out that just having the person who's giving them the drink, the person who's running the experiment, know whether it has caffeine in it or not can actually be a problem uh, because that person can communicate to, in non-verbally, even unintentionally, to the people who are getting the energy drink that they actually are doing better. Um, and this is a problem sometimes in medical treatments. Um, doctors will be like, well, you know, you're not supposed to know, but um, I know you're actually getting the real medicine. And that can throw off your study. And so what we do in that case to event, prevent that problem is what's called a double blind study. And this is kind of the gold standard, especially in medical testing. This is what people usually do. In a double blind study, Neither the um, subject nor the person administering it know which treatment is which. And so what this does is this prevents the experimenter from causing problems because they believe that it should work or shouldn't work. Okay? And so in a double-blind study, what you'll typically do is somebody who's completely unassociated, working at a lab or something like that, will randomize all the treatments. So they'll make up a batch of 100 um, prepackaged drinks, 50% uh, of which have caffeine in them, 50% of which don't have caffeine in them, um, unlabeled containers, maybe they have... Uh, usually they'll have like a number on them or something so that you can tell after the fact you can do what's called unblinding the study which is actually at the end you say okay let's look and see which ones actually had caffeine um, and then see what the results are um, but during the experiment nobody knows neither the person getting the beverage or the person administering it okay and so double blind studies are what are generally used um, in experiments to really get at this um, kind of really deep results that are actually very, very accurate. So it's like medical results if you're testing a new drug or something like that. It's almost always a double-blind study. Okay? In our next video, we'll talk about ethics.